don't, don't meet his eyes. Those were the last words Jeffrey said to me before he died. I went to ask him what he was talking about, what and who he meant, but I could see that the last ember of life had already faded from his eyes and his face began to slacken. I looked around. No one else had seen or heard. We'd gone to his secluded house by design. His design. Whatever he'd planned for me, I felt sure it was going to happen here tonight. It had all happened so fast, but I couldn't be mistaken, right? I'd seen what he'd written and sent. And if he hadn't planned on doing it before I got my phone back and was tipped off by the responses, then what was the point? No, no, I had done the only thing I could. Standing up from where Jeffrey lay at the bottom of the stairs, head cracked open and spilling a trickle of red at the edge of his hair, I noticed its color was slowly changing from a soft brown to a slick black as the blood soaked in. I'd hit him with a small paperweight I'd grabbed from his desk, causing him to stumble back into the hall and fall down the stairs. I just run up the stairs to send Stadia a message, but he'd known I might have seen what he'd written, and I couldn't risk him attacking me without having some kind of weapon on hand, even if it was just a small but heavy glass globe. I also couldn't accuse him of anything. We were alone, after all, and if I let on that I knew what he was up to, well, nothing good, he could overpower and kill me. On the other hand, if I could just get to the front door, make up some excuse, and go back out to the car, I could be away before he ever had a chance to hurt me. I'd tried to just get out. But when I'd first looked up, I saw something pass over his face as his eyes went from me to the phone in my hand and back. And for the few seconds it took me to palm the glass ball and walk toward him, I'd watched his face pale and then redden slightly as his features took on a harder edge. It was a face that said the decision had already been made, and now it was just a matter of doing what needed to be done. When he'd reached for me, it it wasn't my fault. I'd just been def- I started to retch then, not from nausea, but from something small and hard suddenly digging into the back of my throat. I turned away from him and coughed before gagging again. What was it? How had something gotten into my mouth in the first place? Tears streamed from the corners of my eyes as blood pounded in my ears, and I coughed harder as I reached two fingers to pry loose whatever was wedged in the back of my throat. I had a moan of panic when my fingers only managed to brush the edge of something cool, hard, and angular nestled above the writhing root of my tongue. Shoving my hand further, I got deep enough to press down on whatever it was and rake it forward, spilling it from my mouth with a quick shake of my head. It twinkled as it balanced on the hardwood floor before coming to a rest in a pale patch of moonlight. It was a small, silver key. October 21st, 2021. 3.21 p.m. Sorry, I'm running late. I'm just parking now. No problem. I just sat down. (laughs) I'm the nervous-looking guy in the striped shirt sitting on the patio. (laughs) Be right there. October 21st, 2021, 8.17pm. Just wanted to say, again, how great it was to meet you. Looking forward to next weekend. Me too. I was nervous about setting up with somebody, but I think Sadie did pretty awesome. Yeah, I owe her. (laughs) Talk to you soon. October 31st, 2021, 2.25 p.m. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween to you. Sorry I had to call it quits so early last night. I promise once I'm back in town in two weeks, I'm going to be bugging you nonstop. (laughs) I'm looking forward to it. Have a good flight. November 16th, 2021. 10.49 a.m. I just got the flowers. 
They're really pretty. Good. Not too much. I know it's weird getting stuff at work sometimes, but I wanted it to be a surprise. No, I like surprises, and this was a good one. I was going to call you later anyway. You want to go to an outdoor concert thing this weekend? We can, yeah. That sounds cool. And I'd like to show you my house, too, if you're up for it. They finally finished the remodeling while I was out of town, so it's actually livable. I even have the hot tub working if it's not too cold. <laughs> that sounds great. November 20th, 2021. 9.23 p.m. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do this in your house. I really liked you, but it won't work out. Nothing's ever worked out for me. I'll try not to make so much of a mess. I'm sorry. November 19th, 2021. 8.58 p.m. So, you're going out with Mr. Awesome again tomorrow still, or do I get to hang out with you sometime? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm excited about tomorrow. He's invited me to visit his house after the concert. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, if you're getting laid, that's a good excuse. <laughs> Shut up, I didn't say that. <laughs> didn't deny it either, you slut. <sighs> Just for that, I'm not telling you any details. That's no fair. You know I live vicariously through your adventures. <laughs> we'll see. November 20th, 2021. 9.24 p.m. Sorry, Sadie. You know how I've struggled with this for so long. You've tried to help me and I love you for it, but... I can't keep living like this. When you hear about how I died, just... No, it was my choice, and none of it was your fault. I stared down at that phone. I hadn't wrote this. Not this message, or the one to Jeffrey. And I'd had my phone with me until he took it into his home office to charge it while we changed and went down to the hot tub. It, it had to be him. But why? Why would he send messages to himself and to Sadie? Like, what, I, I was going to kill myself? Was it some kind of joke? But what kind of joke was that? Sadie would be terrified. She knew I wasn't suicidal, but she'd still think something was wrong. Maybe even enough to call the cops if... If she knew where I was. Did she know the address? They'd been friends through the gym the last couple of years, but... Did she actually know him that well? If something had happened to me, would she even know where to look? My jumbled train of terrified thoughts shuddered and leapt off into some internal dark as I heard a sound behind me. A small squeak from a floorboard near the door. I'd heard it when Jeffrey came to plug up my phone, and then again when I came in just now, and... I looked back. Jeffrey was staring at me. His face pale as his eyes went from me to the phone in my hand and back to my face. Heart pounding. I tried to give him a smile, hand trailing across the desk for a weapon as I started turning toward him. I touched the small glass globe and gripped it tightly, willing his eyes to stay on my face as I told him I was excited to try out the hot tub. He didn't look down, but my stomach was still twisting in on itself. His face. Oh god, his face. He knew. He knew, or at least worried that I knew, and his face was growing hard, and he was reaching for me, and all I knew to do was... reach down and pick up the key. He was plain and unadorned, but surprisingly heavy, and despite having come from halfway down my throat... I had felt totally dry as I hefted it in my palm. Had he somehow drugged me and stuffed that down my throat? But no, I wasn't missing any time or memory, and it hadn't been there before Jeffrey fell on the stairs. There was no way I wouldn't have felt it. So then, that's mine. 
I let out a scream as the booming voice behind me spoke. Spinning around, I saw a tall, thin, naked man standing on the other side of the floor looking at me and... Don't meet his eyes. I dropped my eyes at the last moment, more out of instinct than any fully formed reason or thought. I didn't understand anything that was going on, but something in me was whispering that I couldn't look into this man's eyes or I'd be lost. Give me the key, bitch. Give it to me, or I'll make you suffer. My first impulse was to throw the key at him, both to give him what he wanted and hopefully distract him long enough that I could get out of the front door and get away. Jeffrey had driven us up here, but I'd seen a house a couple of miles down the road, and anything was better than staying in here with this madman yelling at me, and I should just give him the key, shouldn't I? But I hesitated. Was that the right thing to do? The smart thing to do? What was that key for? And where had the key and the man come from? What if giving him the key was the wrong choice? My tongue felt thick in my throat as I kept my eyes on the pale, hairy belly that lay between a rib-stretched chest and withered gray member. Uh, no. I don't think I can. I don't know what's going on. Who are you? I felt the instinct to look up at him while I talked, to see what I could read from his face, but I stopped myself. What are you doing here? His laughter poured out into the dim space between us like a poison cloud. <laughs> I'm here to get my key, you dim mewling cunt. It was with him, Pratt, that he was, and now you've killed him and claimed it. Now give it to me, and I'll be on my way. He hacked up something thick and wet sounding and spat the dark wad onto the floor between us. If you make me stay... I promise you'll regret it. I was shaking now with anger and disgust, but most of all, fear. Gritting my teeth, I clenched the key tightly and headed for the door. You stay or go. I'm leaving. As I began stepping outside to run, I dreaded the moment when he reached for me and drug me back inside, those long, spindly fingers wrapping around my shoulders and neck as he pulled me down and breathed his noxious laugh into my ear. But he never touched me. Instead, he just screamed. Screamed that I would pay. Oh, how I would pay. I began to run, but his voice was already fading, and not just from the growing distance. Within a matter of moments, the sound of him had faded to nothing. I was down on the road and jogging back toward the direction of the town when I first realized that the key was changing too, becoming lighter, more insubstantial. As I held it up to the moonlight, I began to see light through it, and then it faded further as it slowly sank down into my skin. I stared at all this, transfixed, my amazement stealing away my terrors for just a moment. Was I dreaming all of this? Or maybe he'd slipped me something after all. Oh god, he'd poisoned me? I started thinking about calling 911 when I remembered the strange man I'd just left behind. I had to get away and get somewhere safe. Then I could worry about who I was going to call and what I would tell them. I glanced back in the direction I'd come and sucked in a breath as I saw the figure of the man twenty feet behind me on the road, his form partially obscured by the shadows of the nearby woods. Keeping my eyes low, I began backing up. Keep the fuck away from me. With each step I took backward, he took one forward, and when I stumbled and paused a second, so did he. What was this? Some kind of sick game? Whatever it was, I had to get away before he got tired of playing. Taking off running again, I made it down the hill before a hot stitch began tracing its burning tendrils up my side. I needed to pace myself. I had probably another mile to go before I got to the first house, but at least I hadn't heard any sign of... I glanced back. 
The man was still back there, spindly limbs flailing silently as he kept my pace. There was no sound to him anymore. Not his breath or footfalls or even the bitter rumble of his laughter as I stopped and began to scream at him to stop. The only relief was that he'd stopped when I did. Just as soon as I did, in fact. A thought occurred to me and I took a step forward, toward him. He took a step back. I didn't quite dare to look at his face, but I saw that his chest was still now, aside from a steady rhythm of a heavy breath. No more laughter, silent or otherwise, from him now. Clenching my fist, I took three more running steps forward, and he backpedaled just as quickly. When I backed up again, he came forward the first couple of steps and then stopped. But when I put more distance between us this time, the man let the greater space remain. Holding up my hand to block the top part of his face, I risked a look at his mouth. He seemed to seethe with anger for a moment, but then his mouth went slack before mouthing out a word as he gave me a wave. Later. He didn't follow me to the house I found, and as I frantically beat on the door, I kept waiting for him to pop back up, but there was still no sign of him. But I wasn't taking any chances, and when a confused and irritated-looking old woman opened the door, I pushed past her, telling her to close the door and that I needed to call 911. I didn't wait to ask for her phone or try to explain what a girl in one piece was doing banging on the door in the middle of the night. I just needed her to lock the door and keep it closed while I... I had a missed text message. November 20th, 2021. 10.51 p.m. Please tell me I'm not too late. I just got this message. I know you've been talking about ending things, but like I always say, you have so much to live for. Please be okay and call me when you get this. I didn't see her for the next month. Not that Sadie hadn't tried to call and text, even come by my house and job. She had. She tried to play it off like she was confused, like she didn't know, like, like I was stupid. But I wasn't stupid. And to be fair, I'd been busy. The police had questioned me three times, but they could see the messages. And while bizarre, my story of him planning on killing me and making it look like a suicide was the only real version they had. I could have told them that Sadie had been in on it from the start, that I'd never talked to her or anyone else about killing myself, but that would have just made them look into it more, and that didn't help me. I needed Sadie out and free, and when the time came, ready to meet. That was the day before Christmas Eve at a park we used to eat lunch at back when we worked together after college. I felt a pain in my chest when I saw her. She'd see me now. Her face lit with a fake smile as she tried to look friendly and innocent. She'd been my best friend for so long. And she'd thrown it all away for what? Jeffrey? She went to hug me and I held up my hand to stop her. Wait. Stop. Let's not pretend like everything's okay. Sadie went to argue and then stopped herself with a frown. Fuck. Fine. So what do you want? Her eyes narrowed. If you're wearing a recorder or something, just know I'm not saying anything because I don't know anything. I'm not stupid. Like you. I stared at her a moment before shaking my head. No, that's not what this is about. No recorder and you don't have to say anything. Letting out a small laugh, I shrugged. <laughs> I mean, at first I really wanted to know why... You know. Like, why him? Why me? What did either of you get out of faking my suicide? I paused to look at Sadie, who just stared back at me silently. Sitting down at the far end of the bench, I kept my eye on her as I continued. But that thing Jeffrey gave me? It's still with me. 
I pointed to where it stood, glowering at me from the green lawn between us and the far side of the park. I see it every day. No matter where I go. Not all the time, but enough. My jaw clenched. Enough that I have to be on guard every moment, making sure I never lock eyes when it decides to pop up. I saw her pale a little bit as she stared out to the grass, her eyes roving back and forth. You don't see him. I know. No one does but me. I guess Jeffrey used to, right? He won't tell me what their deal was or how Jeffrey wound up with him, but it's surprisingly good at getting messages across even though I can't hear him. Sadie swallowed and licked her lips. What, uh, what does it tell you? It tells me that I missed my chance to free it. To be free of it. That it's bound to me now for as long as I live. That when I die, it'll move on to the one that kills me or touches my body first. And so on and so on until someone gives it back its key. She nodded, her eyes glistening with tears as she looked at me. I'm so sorry. If I'd known how bad it was, I wouldn't. I glared at her. Shut up, you're lying, you pathetic cunt. You knew, you knew very well. It's told me the way I can get peace for a while. If I give it a life, it will leave me alone for a whole ten years. Same deal he was given to Jeffrey. Sadie's eyes widened. That's right. That same bad that you... that you're going through. That's what Jeffrey went through, too. He'd already lived with it for years when I met him, and I saw him suffer with it. Fuck, you're right. I knew how bad it was, but he was the love of my life, okay? And I couldn't watch him suffer anymore. She shook her head. I'm the one that convinced him to do it. Everything seemed to crystallize around me, every sight and sound and thought painful and sharp. Why? I was your best friend. You were like my sister. She sniffled. It wasn't because I wanted you dead. I just wanted to make sure he wouldn't get hurt doing it or be at risk of getting arrested for it. I knew. Sadie let out a sigh. I thought you wouldn't catch on time. And couldn't fight him if you did. And they'd believe it was suicide if your best friend backed it up. I nodded. Thank you. You've made this all easier. I've been so hurt and so angry, spent so much time trying to explain away or excuse what you did while promising myself that you'd regret it. My voice started to grow thick, but I pushed on. I still love you, you know? That's the sad part. You've infected my life with this... Fuck, do you even know what it is? Sadie shook her head, crying freely now. Jeffrey never told me a lot. He was ashamed of it, terrified of it. He just showed me enough to make me understand it was real. Leaning over, I lashed out and gripped her arm as she let out a small cry. Like this... Did he make you understand like this? She closed her eyes tight, turned away. No, I I don't want to see it again. I let out a nasty snicker. <laughs> oh, really? Is it too much for you? But you've barely seen it. I could feel the connection running through me, tying Sadie to me and me to the thing watching us from the grass. I could feel its influence, its power flow through me, seizing Sadie's muscles before she could move turning her face back toward the lawn. Please. Please, I'm sorry. Please don't make me look at its eyes. I gripped her arm harder. You know, it told me it can be painless if I want. Like a bite that numbs you while you get eaten by a snake or a spider. Her head and face were still now, other than the trembling of her cheeks as tears streamed down them. So I was going to ask it to just put you to sleep first, but I've changed my mind. You see, I'm really, really not suicidal. 
I love my life. I heard my voice grow rougher and colder. And you tried to take what was mine. So now I'm taking it back. At least for the next ten years. Please, don't. Shut the fuck up. Shut up and open your eyes. Between 1991 and 1993, American author John Anthony West and his team of archaeologists conducted a series of geological and seismic surveys around the Great Sphinx of Giza. The resulting seismogram indicated the existence of several unexplored tunnels and cavities in the bedrock beneath the monument, the most notable of which was a chamber located at an approximate depth of 25 feet beneath its front paws. Following the remarkable discovery, the team was abruptly and rather suspiciously expelled from the site by Egyptian authorities, which inspired a slew of increasingly outlandish conspiracy theories. Around that time is when we got involved. I will refrain from disclosing who we exactly are, or were, rather, Think of us as a group of independent contractors that specialized in the procurement, study, and safekeeping of, let's call it, anomalous paraphernalia, the type of unconventional curiosities that require a special touch to handle. We arrived in Giza during the summer of 1994. The local government has tasked us with the excavation and transportation of whatever valuables lay beneath the 73-meter-long statue, a rather tame job compared to our usual ventures. The officials we spoke to claimed ignorance, emphasizing they weren't actually certain whether there was anything down there in the first place, anomalous or otherwise. However, on the off chance that there were indeed relics of immense cultural significance stashed there, they didn't want to risk having them dug up by some nosy tourist instead. I don't like this, sir. We're going in blind. My assistant, whom I've renamed Brian for the purpose of the story, muttered under his breath as we both stood overlooking the monolith. In the distance past it, partially obscured by shifting fog of dust, stood the iconic trio of pyramids, their perfectly symmetrical peaks reaching toward the orange-tinted sky above. Brian turned to face me, the glare of the descending sun reflecting off his circular glasses. With his boyish perm and inquisitive blue eyes, he reminded me of a college freshman more than he did a professional that had nearly a decade of experience under his belt. I flashed him a dismissive smile and produced another cigarette from my breast pocket. Pissing your britches already, I teased over the incessant whirring of the excavation drill. I just have a bad feeling about this one, that's all. If the job is as straightforward as they say, why hire us? We're clearly overqualified for this. I shrugged while expectantly clasping the unlit cigarette between my lips. Brian registered the hint and started rummaging through his own pockets, eventually fishing out a lighter and handing it over. We're through, exclaimed a voice in the background. We were met with the sight of our senior seismologist, half jogging towards us. His face was red and glistening with perspiration, but there was a proud grin concealed beneath that unkempt mustache of his. We're through, he breathlessly repeated once he was closer to us. You're good to go. Did you get a look at what's down there? Brian inquired. There was a mixture of impatience and... Unease, clearly audible in his tone. Our colleague wiped his forehead with his sleeve. He looked over his shoulder at the limestone colossus in whose shadow he was standing. The statue's inanimate eyes stared back in turn, partially eroded expression, ever stoic and unflinching. I... I managed to sneak peek. Chamber seems pretty empty to me. Kind of anticlimactic if I'm honest. Wait, what do you mean? Empty. Precisely what I just said. Ain't nothing down there as far as I can tell. No urns, no parchments, no gold. 
just a ceiling and four walls with nothing but dust between them. You think somebody beat us to it? I chimed, expelling a stream of smoke through my nostrils. Improbable, but not impossible, I suppose. That'll be for you two to confirm. I nodded, drew one final whiff from a cancer stick, and then snuffed it against the scalding sand with my heel. Right. Let's get this done. There's a cold pint with my name on it back at HQ. Moments later, Brian and I were waddling toward the base of the Sphinx, donned in hazmat suits and armed with a pair of industrial flashlights. You'd be surprised how often the purportedly cursed items we were sent to retrieve were just radioactive or comprised of hazardous materials. Quite regularly, in fact. I approached the gaping drill hole next to the statue's right paw, lowered myself into a sitting position, and started climbing down it via rope ladder followed closely by my incredulous protege. Darkness enveloped us both. As soon as my feet hit what felt like solid ground, I retreated back a few steps and flicked on my torch. Jesse was right, I remarked, voice amplified by the transmitter affixed to my respirator. I was standing in the middle of a cavernous subterranean space that, indeed held nothing at the first glance. Both of value and in general, particles floated past the beams of artificial light we wielded, kicked up by our movements throughout the hollow chamber. Sand trickled from cracks in the ceiling, its integrity undoubtedly compromised by the massive borehole from which we had descended. Though this place resembled no tomb, it could have been ours if we chose to linger for too long. Time-worn iconography decorated the walls, featuring your usual cast of deities. There was the ram-headed form of Ra, standing atop his solar bark, flanked by Sia and Heka as they sailed across the underworld. Nearby was a portrayal of Osiris sitting on his throne, his wife Isis dutifully at his side, and wise Thoth acting as their scribe. Of course, there was the enigmatic Anubis, depicted tending to the deceased or passing judgment upon them. And then there was another figure I couldn't quite recognize, and yet featured quite prominently. The deity was near identical to his jackal-headed counterpart, distinguished solely by his more militant garbs and the weapons he held, usually a bow or a curved blade. Further imagery consistently depicted the Sinocephalus fighting some sort of beast, as though engaged in internal rivalry with the creature. Some murals illustrated the four-legged monster consuming its adversary and ushering an age of strife. Others portrayed the warrior god as the victor, standing above his slain foe while soldiers, priests, and peasants alike rejoiced. Uh, sir? I looked back at Brian, who, in turn, had his flashlight raised toward the farthermost wall of the chamber, illuminating it. Below a gilded etching of the anonymous god, with his copash raised above his canine head, was the lid of a sarcophagus. Standing upright and partially embedded within the sandstone itself, its painted likeness observing us from across the room. I guess the place was a tomb after all, albeit an unusually spacious and empty one. Sand crunched beneath our boots as we advanced towards our find. I was the one leading the charge, of course, with Brian in tow. As I got closer, I began noticing more details about the anthropoid coffin, namely the contrast between its distinctly human face and the cat-like paws folded onto its body. Egyptian coffins were rarely made to represent what their occupant actually looked like, so the occasional creative liberty wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And yet, I couldn't help but draw parallels between its design and the half-human, half-feline monument beneath which it was located. An unlikely coincidence, to be certain. I placed my glove hand over the vertical lid and leaned closer. There were no gaps to speak of. 
It was as if the wall had been molded around the sarcophagus, fitting it like a cast. It was an admittedly bothersome but hardly unconquerable obstacle, given the heavy-duty equipment the lads on the surface had at their disposal. Sir, what are you doing? What does it look like? I murmured back. Aren't you being a bit too handsy? We don't know what's inside. Some dead bloke? <laughs> Look, mate, if you're worried, why don't you just... I almost spit through my own tongue as a sudden surge of pain assaulted my head. It felt as if someone had stabbed my brain with a dagger, twisting and driving it deeper as the pain kept amplifying. It was horrible. Maddening. I stumbled back, uselessly clawing at my visor. There was no escaping it. I would have gladly accepted death if it meant reprieve from this hell. My balance was quick to falter. I was reduced to squirming on the ground like a snail doused with salt, desperate for relief. The last thing I saw was the outline of my assistant looming over me and reaching for his handheld radio in a panic-stricken fit before everything faded to black. I'm not sure how long I remained in that place. Days? Years? Centuries, perhaps. The concept of linear time had lost all of its meaning. All there was was the infinite void. It was barren, dark, and quiet, where absence reigned supreme. At first, I feared the emptiness. Let it drive me to the brink of insanity, but I eventually became part of it. As he drifts through the abyss without direction, without purpose, all you feel is apathy. You aren't content to be there per se, but leaving seems like such an impossibility that it isn't even worth considering. You are no one in a universe of nothing. You don't even exist. You are nothing, and nothing's only purpose is to be nothing until made into something. And then there was a light. Multiple, to be precise. I'd compare them to the stars in the night sky if they didn't seem so close. They were more like a constellation of moons, their silver brilliance gleaming against the expanse of knee-deep water I was apparently now standing in. I looked down for the first time in what felt like millennia, confirming that I was indeed whole. Nude, but whole. Warm waves of unknown origin splashed against my thighs and caressed the tips of my fingers. It was soothing, like ointment for the inflamed wound that was my abused psyche. Unfortunately, my moment of tranquility was meant to be just that. A fleeting moment. It would appear that with age does not always come wisdom. Hmm? The disembodied voice brought with it echoes of that hellish pain. I winced and grabbed at both sides of my throbbing head, trying to keep my skull from splitting apart. Thankfully, it subsided rather quickly compared to last time. When I next opened my eyes, I saw that there was an elderly man standing in front of me and looking back. Believe me, I know, he added with a toothless smile. Though the stranger's face was a crisscross of wrinkles and faded scars, age has certainly spared his posture. He was roughly as tall as I was, maybe even taller, and had the body of an athlete that was nowhere near past his prime. The man's broad physique was draped in a simple silken tunic, which transitioned into a kilt that brushed against the surface of the shallow sea. The most unique element of his ensemble, however, was undoubtedly the wolf pelts he wore as a scarf, with the dead animal's skull mounted onto one of his shoulders like some sort of morbid ornament. Who are you? I finally asked. Every word spoken took on a life of its own, reverberating throughout the aether. 
The old man tucked a wispy strand of pale hair behind his ear and then sighed in disappointment. <sighs> you invade my temple, attempt to ransack it, and yet you do not even know who I am. His tone made me feel like a child getting scolded by their parent. I had the urge to apologize for my ignorance, but he never even gave me the chance. It could not be helped, I suppose. My brother was always the favorite. I am referred to as Wapawet by your kind. You may know Grovel, should you like. I could have sworn that I saw something flicker behind the wolf's head's missing eyes in that exact moment he pronounced his name. If his intonation hadn't been so blatantly sarcastic, I would have dropped my knees and pleaded for my soul without an inkling of dignity. Instead, I looked back to the glowing orbs pinned against the black canvas above us. Where am I? was the next obvious question, which Wepoet answered with a question of his own. Where do you think you are? Am I dead? No, no. Eternal rest is reserved for the deserving. You, friend, have set in motion something that you must now correct. He unclasped his fingers from behind his back and made a swirling motion with his finger. I'm not sure whether I turned around on my own volition or whether I was compelled to do so, but regardless, I wish I hadn't. There, towering... In the distance was something truly titanic. Its existence was impossible. A creature the size of a city, maybe even a small country. The more I tried wrapping my head around it, the larger it appeared, refusing to relinquish the impact of its sheer magnitude. It wasn't content with simply occupying my field of view. No, it sought to ensure that my feeble mind could never fully grasp its humidity. There were bronze chains cutting into the behemoth's side and metal rods, each dwarfing the tallest structure ever built by man, nailing its paws to the platform atop which it was raised. Forests of fur covered its enormous mass like the slopes of a mountain, but it was the head at the pinnacle of its bestial body that petrified me. I can't bring myself to describe it. I've tried, believe me, but whenever I dwell on that accursed visage for too long, my mind spirals. It's like a black hole, warping and consuming any independent thought that dares exist alongside it. If to be human is to be the center of one's own universe then that thing was more human than any of us will ever be. Beautiful, is she not? I wither and yet she remains unchanged since our very first battle. I lowered my eyes to my trembling hands, which I noticed were dripping with murky, sanguine fluid. The water we trod wasn't water after all. How? How can something bleed so much and never die? You ask many questions, friend. The being that presented himself as an old man now swayed beside me, calm as a morning breeze despite standing in a literal ocean of blood. I've always hated that about your kind. So many questions with nothing to offer in return. I pried my lips, but before I could utter the first syllable of what I would likely be another witless inquiry, one of the massive chains restraining the equally massive beast suddenly snapped. Both pieces of it fell to the ground with a distant rumble, followed by a tremor that nearly knocked me off my feet. And then another shackle came off. And then another. As I watched that impossible creature with the face of a wrathful goddess begin to rise from its podium, eclipsing the lights, littering the sky with its own cruel radiance, there was only one truth left to declare. It's going to devour us all. 
Indeed, confirmed Wet Poet, while he leisurely circled around me. You... You have to kill that thing before it's too late. Oh, I have. More times than you can count. Yet she always comes back, stronger and hungrier than ever before, while I grow weaker with each passing century. My followers knew that. So they converted my temple to a tomb and trapped her essence within it. That is, until you and your people came along. Images of the ornate sarcophagus Brian and I found flashed before my eyes. It was getting loaded onto one of our trucks. Perhaps there was still hope, for it had not yet been opened. I took a deep breath, inhaled the stench of copper that polluted the stagnant air, and mustered the courage to face the stranger's true form for the first time. The burning eyes of the wolf god, Wepoet, pierced my wretched soul with flames of enlightenment. Tell me what I must do. The next thing I knew, I was lying in my tent, sprawled across the sleeping bag. Brian was pacing nervously nearby. He was overwhelmed with relief to see me conscious again, a side of his prudent personality I was really privy to. I lured the poor boy into a heartfelt embrace when I drove my master's blade between his ribs. The blessed knife slid easily past the protective suit he had yet to remove as if it was no obstacle at all. It's okay. I got you. It'll be over soon, I whispered in the ear of the closest thing to a son that I've ever had. His expression still haunts my nightmares. Seeing the fear and betrayal in those blue eyes was the worst thing I'd experienced thus far. I held back tears as I grabbed a fistful of his hair and craned his head back, then ended his struggles with a subsequent slit across the throat, allowing his lifeless shell to slump into my lap. (sighs) Having taken my first life, the rest came almost naturally. Dawn lined the desert horizon in faint reds and yellows. I couldn't help but marvel at it for a bit, before resuming to drag the body of my final colleague to that borehole. Sorry, mate, was all that I could think to say as I took the truck keys from his pocket and pushed him down into the chamber with the rest. He landed on the pile with a muffled thud. Given the circumstances, it was the closest thing to a burial I could offer them, before the local authorities came snooping. I'm not sure whether they are still down there, or if the government had them pulled out before filling the pit. It didn't really matter, I suppose. All that mattered was getting myself and the sarcophagus far away from there. I wiped a bead of sweat from my brow and glanced up at the stony visage of the Sphinx one final time. I, of course, knew that what I was doing was ultimately futile. Sooner or later, she's going to break loose the chains that bind her and exact her revenge upon all of existence. There will be no gods left to stop her, no tomb or coffin large enough to contain her. But then again, is it not just so painfully human to try and delay the inevitable? I want to give a quick thank you to all of my $5 patrons and members. Absinthe Alice, Alice E, Amethyst, Amet, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, Alice G, Furious Weasel, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Lee Riggs, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Nicholas Moore, Nikki Parsons, Nova Nocturne, Ray Clegg, Centennial, The New Ongoing 24, Tiger Princess, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the continued support. I really, really appreciate it.